Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show today. I'm super excited to bring on an amazing guest, Bronson Hill. Bronson, thanks for being here. Hey, Sujata, it's really uh, exciting to be with you and your audience. Just really excited to have this conversation with you and talk about real estate. Awesome. I know you're going to provide a ton of value. So everyone, Bronson, as the mass managing member of Bronson Equity, bronsonequity.com, he is a general partner in over $60 million in multifamily assets. Bronson co-leads a large in-person multifamily meetup in Pasadena, California, called Phoebe Pasadena Multifamily. Bronson understands the investor mindset, having spoken individually on the phone with over a thousand investors and having raised $15 million for real estate deals. Bronson is the author of The Single Best Investment Strategy During or After a Pandemic and is a regular contributor to YouTube and Bigger Pockets. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on, Bronson. Why don't you take us back in time and give us some sense of what drew you into this space? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I uh, wanted to get involved in real estate. I had a house that I had owned in another state and just kind of became an accidental landlord. And then looking back over the years, I realized, wow, that was a great investment. I did very well in that, just kind of holding on to that. And so with a relative, we started buying single family houses in the Cleveland area. And so I had this single family portfolio and I thought, this is great. I'm going to get all this uh, income, but it was kind of a lot of work. And I have this cousin who is very successful in uh, multifamily. And we had kind of a chance meeting. I just, I hadn't, he's more of a distant cousin. And I, basically I told him my plan was to get 30 single family houses and retire with passive income. And he looked at me and he said, you know, that sounds like a lot of work. Why don't you do multifamily? And I thought, well, oh gosh, I, I'd love to, but I, I don't have the money. And so I shared that with him and he said, well, you can raise the money. And so he kind of basically led me on a, on a journey of what that would look like. He said, listen to this podcast, go to this event, read this book. So I did everything he said. I ended up starting a meetup. So this was a number of years ago. And uh, over time, I, I was able to uh, you know, find a way to connect with uh, an, an investor, bring him to a deal. That's how I got my start in my first deal. Then I was able to partner and through partnership, I was able to raise uh, over $15 million. Now we're at about $17 million raised and about close to a hundred million in real estate. So it's exciting. So it's amazing about this business that it really is like a snowball. You start small and then once you get experience, it's amazing the opportunities that you have to be able to scale, which is something that really doesn't exist in single family, which a lot of people think that, you know, single family is going to lead to financial freedom, but it rarely does. Yeah, that's, um, that's uh, sir, so much in there. So just to sort of um, put, uh, help me understand the timeline, were you, how many years ago was it that you you kind of talked to your cousin about multifamily? Yeah, so that was only uh, about four years ago. So it wasn't that long ago. So I'm pretty new to this. And so it's, you know, hopefully this will be encouraging to anybody who's trying to scale their business, that it's possible to get to a place where you're, you know, you really grow and you're able to do some substantial things in a short amount of time. Awesome. Yeah, that's very inspiring. It's a great timeline. And I think a lot of people, I mean, this is a common thread in our industry, start with single family homes. It's kind of the most understandable. Almost everybody starts there. And at some point we realize that, okay, in order to really scale and grow, uh, multifamily might be a good option to look at. Um, so Bronson, you've raised $17 million. What have you learned in speaking to those thousand investors that you've spoken to over the phone? Yeah, so I've learned quite a bit. I mean, I think to me, you know, after you do something a lot, I mean, these are typically 30 minute phone calls. This is, you know, over 500 hours. Actually, it was probably close to 1,200 investors um, now. But just basically, when you start talking to people um, that are in a different place than you're at, and these are a lot of people that are doctors, they're lawyers, they're business owners, they're, um, you know, business professionals. And a lot of, there's a few themes that really come up. So one theme is typically that time is very, very important. So what I realized is a lot of people even that um, could be investing in real estate are either not investing in real estate because it takes too much time or they are. And this doctor that gets paid hundreds of dollars or more per hour is out, you know, either doing the toilets and fixing them in the middle of themselves, or they're getting the calls from the property manager and kind of helping to solve, you know, try to resolve these problems. So uh, it's really not the best and most efficient use of their time, but a lot of them feel like I just don't have any time. And so 
that's really where I felt, you know, really educating people on passive investing is really important. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is really uh, a lot of busy people, a lot of well-paid professionals, people that make over 100, 200, $300,000 a year, they typically are taxed very highly. And so being able to provide tax advantaged uh, investments to them, which multifamily real estate is, I really feel like it's almost an unfair asset class where you actually can take the money that you're earning and you can be able to get uh, tax deferred or tax-free uh, you know, depreciation. You get to kind of write off some or all of the uh, stuff that you make uh, over time, which is huge. So being able to educate people on, on those things is really important. And uh, again, it's just, I think for a lot of people, it's just, you know, it's, it's different than what they do at their job. It's different than what they do where they, they're a physician or if they're a dentist, they have full control over their practice or their business or whatever they're doing. And when they trust someone else or they're trusting another group, group, uh, that can be for a lot of people just feel like, well, do people really do that? Do I wire 50K or 100K to somebody I've never met? And just kind of getting around the idea that, oh, this is actually a, uh, a common thing people do to basically get much higher returns than Wall Street. And so, um, so anyway, so just those, some of those conversations around the use of their time, as well as the efficiency of uh, really getting money working for you in a passive way, and just kind of helping educate on those concepts has been critical. Awesome. And would you say that when you first talk to investors, are they new to real estate syndications or do they have some experience with it so far? So yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it's a range. So we have some that, you know, there's the doctor that has a net worth of 5 million who's never invested in any real estate and is only invested in stocks and bonds. And I just want to make a side note here. It's really interesting that uh, we consider stocks and bonds to be traditional investments. And one of the reasons for that is because I actually used to be an investment advisor is that these firms spend, you know, Wall Street firms spend, spend billions of dollars a year to convince you that these are, these paper assets are traditional and they're safe. And in reality, as we've watched in 2008 and years before, and even you know what's happened even in 2020, March of 2020, stock markets can crash by 30 to 50% or more in a very short period of time. And yet we look at real estate, particularly multifamily real estate, which moves at a different pace than single family, and it's a much more safe and secure asset. So um, anyway, I think I, I think I detracted from your original question, but it was a good side note. So I'd love to, maybe you could refresh me on <laughs> the question there. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's such a good point that, you know, it, for those of us in the real estate world, it seems to me that real estate is actually a safer and in some ways more traditional asset class. I mean, you know, you can't just dump your money in and take it out in the same way. But um, anyway, so I think that's a really good point that, you know, there's a bit of a paradigm shift that I think that all of us in real estate are kind of trying to help um, other people see part of that. And so, but the question was just, is our doc, are the people that you're talking to these thousand investors, had they been exposed to real estate syndications or not? Right. So that's something early in the conversation when I would get on the phone with somebody or even, even look at their LinkedIn before I get on there is just see who am I talking with, right? Is it the doctor whose high net worth has no you know, real estate experience, that's going to be a certain type of conversation, just explaining what syndication is, talking about the benefits of real estate. And then we get other people that have invested in 10 or 20 or more deals. And that's going to be a much different type of conversation where they're going to get very much in the technicals. What are the splits? What are the assumptions you're making on the underwriting? What are the values? Those kind of things. And so I think it depends. Um, so so it, it's a range of people. And I think, you know, we've had both types invest in our group. And I think it's just being able to, I think as somebody who raises capital and kind of gets involved in deals on, on that level is just trying to figure out very quickly, who am I speaking with? Am I speaking with somebody who's very sophisticated? So I always ask that question is tell me about your real estate experience. And that is very telling to know kind of you know, what, how the conversation is going to go. Yeah, for sure. And in your opinion, and, and based on your conversations, how can passive investing change people's lives? Yeah, so passive investing to me, it's it's honestly one of the most magical and beautiful ideas that I've ever heard about because um, you know, first step is you know when you start working, and if you come from like maybe maybe a middle class or lower middle class class family, is that you just think, okay, if you're lucky enough, you go get a job and you go to work and you got a job and you know you're able to eat, you're able to have housing and all that's great. So there's a time for money trade, right? And so. Um, as you get to be, you know, hopefully you mature and you grow and you read rich dad, poor dad, and you read different books and you're trying to learn that, oh, this idea of like working for assets or, or trading maybe value 
uh, trying to, you know, trade your time for, for value or kind of leveraging that a bit, then that becomes uh, really, really valuable. But the cool thing about passive investing is that when people invest, uh, not all income is the same. Because if I'm a physician and I make $500,000 a year, which I know some physicians that make quite a bit more than that, but let's say I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but I've got to go to work to make that money. And if I don't go to work, I don't get paid. Um, then I'm still stuck in the time for money trade. And a lot of people don't realize, even though they make a lot of money, they're not really financially free. And I believe true financial freedom comes from when you actually are able to get passive income. When your passive income comes in, what I mean by passive income is basically your assets are generating direct deposit or mailbox money every single quarter, every single month, there's money coming in and it, be, it can actually get up to where it replaces or, or gets above where your normal income is. So I think for a lot of people, when they start hearing about the concept, it's like, oh, the idea of like, yeah, sitting on a beach and sipping Mai Tais and all of a sudden these checks are arriving. I mean, that's one way to look at it. But the, the real way is that, no, you have these investments over here. It frees up your time so that you can do really what your highest purpose is, whether that's seeing family, that's traveling, that's writing that book, that's writing music, whatever your why is of why you're here. A lot of people don't like their jobs. And if you're able to basically take this money that you're making, put it in this other bucket over here that I call passive income, it allows you to really generate much more cash flow than you would otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's um, such an important point is that you were mentioning that just because you make a lot of money doesn't mean you're financially free if you're still trading your time for money and kind of bound to those, to your job. And even if you love your job, it's still, it's still great to have options, right? If something happens with your family, if something you want to change careers, if your partner wants to change careers, it's nice to have more options and more flexibility and not just rely on that job for income coming in. So um, thanks for speaking to that. It's just such a critical crucial um, point that it's one of the reasons why we're all in this in this business. Um, so Bronson, you know, you've been quite successful. I'm curious, how has you used to be an investment advisor, which seems like that was probably advising on stocks and bonds and more quote traditional investments. Is that correct? Yeah. So I did uh, stocks, bonds, and then we had some alternative assets as well, but it got me to really see behind the curtain of a lot of the things that happen in the financial world, even Tony Robbins talked about the average mutual fund will say it's, you know, 1.2% fees, and it's actually more like 3.2%. There's all this hidden stuff that's there. So it's the idea that Wall Street is able to legally kind of take fees and almost cheat you here and there. So I, it kind of really got me thinking, man, I want to be doing something different. That's, you know, more Main Street and less Wall Street. Yeah, for sure. And just for those listeners who may, might not be so familiar with these hidden fees of mutual funds, can you are you able to just break down like what those hidden fees might be and how they might look or how you might even find them? Yeah, so Tony Robbins wrote this amazing book. It's called Money Master the Game, and I highly recommend it. He basically gets into it and he says, you know, Wall Street, it's it's basically a big scam. It's basically all these hidden fees. So for example, when a fund will say, "Hey, I've got this you know, 1.2%, you know, mutual fund It's like, Oh, that's not a bad. Okay. It's a certain amount of fees or whatever. And then on top of that, there's these fees that are not disclosed. There are things such they, they label them such as administrative fee, marketing fee, cash drag fee. There's a whole slew of fees and they legally don't have to disclose these. And you think, well, why would they not have to legally disclose them? Well, it's just because wall street, there's so much money and so much lobbyists, so many lobbyists that are there that they've kind of changed some of these laws. So the average fee ends up being much, much higher than you think. So let's say 3.2% per year is accurate. And then also, if you have a money person, a lot of these physicians, they have a guy, they have a woman, they have somebody that they go to that's, you know, Mer the Merrill Lynch, the Morgan Stanley, the big broker type of people, those people typically take 2% on the top as well. So if you look at that, it's typically around five, five and a half percent per year. And the stock market returns are typically four to 7% per year when you include the down year. So to me, it just looks like a base, it becomes a savings account. And if you look at inflation, uh, you're just really not going to end up ahead. So again, once you kind of start seeing behind the curtains, and if you really want to know a little more about this, try to read a stock prospectus sometime. Try to look into a prospectus for a mutual fund. They're 30, 40, 50, 60 pages, and it's written in things that nobody can understand except for lawyers. So the only reason you do that is because you're trying to actually have people not be able to understand what you're doing. Things should be as simple as they can. If you can't explain it very quickly or to a you know, fifth grader, then maybe it, you know, it's, it's too complex. 
Mm -hmm, for sure. And so were you building your single family home while you were working as an investment advisor? Yeah. So um, again, when I was working as an investment advisor, I was doing stocks and bonds. We had some alternative assets we were doing as well. There was an insurance product called Life Settlements. And so that's kind of the one of the primary things I was working on, but it gave me kind of a, a view into the rest of kind of the other stuff that was happening as well. But yeah, I had the single family stuff going and then I had that going as well. And then when I started doing multifamily, I actually had to leave. It was I was working at the time. I'm no longer an investment advisor, but I was a registered investment advisor. And so in order to do syndication, I had to leave because, again, if you work for a financial firm, you can't be doing these other things on the side. It just gets too complex. So they're like, okay, well, you got to choose. And I was like, okay, I'll choose this. And <laughs> I, I, that was a very good decision. Let's put it that way. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, for sure. And what do you think has led to your success so far in real estate syndication space? Yeah. So the biggest thing that happened for me is um, I was at an event and it was, it was an event that there were a lot of really well-to-do investors there. It was a week long event on a cruise, kind of an investor summit. And I heard somebody say off the cuff and he said this comment, I never heard this before. And he said, make yourself valuable to valuable people. And I just, I, I'd never really heard that. It actually comes from a quote by Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn is a kind of a uh, motivational writer, but the idea of making yourself valuable to valuable people. And I thought, huh, well, who have I gotten value from? And I thought of one of the people on, on the cruise at a podcast and, and just was doing a lot of things in investing. I, so I basically approached him and I said, hey, um, can I help you solve this problem? How is it going in this area? And that began a conversation. And then we basically created a partnership, whereas they were really having trouble raising money and then I came on board. We went from you know raising six hundred thousand dollars for a deal, and over the next eighteen months, uh, we were able to raise fifteen million. And the last deal, we raised eight million dollars in twenty four hours. So it wasn't just me, but it was basically the power of partnership and coming together and creating these resources for passive investors and really targeting them because this person had a big audience for active investors, but they weren't really doing a lot for passive investors. So I think. Uh, the whole point of all that is to say, instead of going to somebody successful and say, I want you to mentor me, or I want you to grow, I want you, I want, I want this from you is you go to that really successful person. You say, tell me what's the biggest challenge in your business or, Hey, how do you solve this certain thing and be listening for what can I personally do to help solve something for this person? Because that creates value. And when you create value, you get paid. Maybe not right away, but over time you do and you learn. So I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned is just really trying to listen and really go to places where there's a need to people that are doing things one, two, three steps ahead of you. For sure. And in your experience in trying that out, do you find that it's like you're, you're able to like, what's the percentage of time you're able to actually figure out how you can add value to one of those people? Is it like, is it like kind of like sometimes or maybe never or? <laughs> yeah, well, Sujata, every single time I'm able to add tons of value and everybody <laughs> says you're the best thing ever. And, you know, uh, no, it, it, I mean, I would say, it, you know, it's hit or miss, but I think just being a person that is curious about other people's concerns and problems. Now, everybody's got problems, everybody's got concerns, but going to people that are high value people, people that are making a huge difference and asking those questions. Now, people come to them all the time and pitch them stuff and people come to them and want stuff from them, but very few people are gonna come and ask that question. Now, I promise you, if they're, if they're high value people, they are asking that question about their business all the time. They are always looking, they're seeing problems in there. And so they could use someone to be able to help. So and it doesn't work every time, it doesn't work a lot of the time, but again, it's our, our success in life, I believe is really equal to our, our willingness to be able to fail. There's this quote from Michael Jordan that says like, I've missed 50,000 shots. I've you know, taken the game winning shot you know, 55 times and lost. And I've done this and this and I keep failing, but that's why I'm successful, right? You keep taking those shots, you keep going after it. So again, if you're willing to have a lot of calls with investors and not everybody invests, only 17% of people that I spoke with actually invested, but that's still, that's still 15 to $17 million now. So again, it's just being willing to take those shots, to have those conversations conversations, to go to the events, to be willing to just, you know, be in there. It feels a little awkward, but just try. And that's where the growth happens, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's a good point. Just keep looking and don't give up. And, um, you know, that grit, that persistence and that willingness to fail so much in there that we could go on and on about. Um, well, Bronson, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm, I, we're going to have to do another episode with you sometime in the future and see where things are at with you and your firm. Um, 
You've provided a ton of value. Please go ahead and tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and anything else you'd like to share. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. This has been awesome. It's been a real treat. I love connecting with people, whether it's uh, people that are curious about raising money or people that are interested in investing. We do have deals that we're doing consistently. I've got that report. I mentioned the single best investing strategy during and after a pandemic. It's at bronsonequity.com. And if you want to shoot me an email, you can also send an email to bronson at bronsonequity.com. But thanks again. This has been a wonderful time. Awesome. Well, I hope you all go and um, take advantage of those resources, get in contact with Bronson and everyone have a great day. We'll see you next time.